Eight troops, koala here. After our last video on a piece of Russian equipment was less than favourable, today we tackle a platform undeniably more successful. The idea that if something is both inexpensive and effective, somebody will inevitably want it, is a factor of military procurement that has always rung true. Certainly the champions of this mentality were the designers of the Soviet Union, and the protagonist of this story sits among the ranks of the famous Kalashnikov rifle, MiG-21 jet fighter, and T-55 and T-72 main battle tanks. Within the sphere of mechanised infantry warfare, from the rainforests of the Congo, to the deserts of Arabia, to the snow-covered straits of Chechnya, no vehicle has carried more troops into battle or fired more shots in their effort than the Boyavaya Machina Pehoti, better known as the BMP. The BMP can be considered the very first of its kind of infantry fighting vehicles, and is still in widespread service to this day. The recognisable machine has spawned a wide variety of variations and served with an impressive 65 nations since its debut in 1966. Like the MiG-21 of the skies, the BMP has proven an adaptable and timeless platform, remaining highly usable in even a modern military force. While most vehicles with routes so old tend only to be operated today by export customers with second or even third hand examples, the BMP still sees production in its original form, as well as deep modernizations, and remains in service at home, with the armed forces of the Russian Federation. The main examples of this undying vehicle are the BMP-1, BMP-2 and BMP-3, and in this video we'll not only cover all three, but also delve into some of their more interesting derivatives. Let us start by looking at where this beast came from, and what made it so successful. This video uses footage from the online military action game War Thunder, where you can crew various models of the BMP alongside thousands of other military vehicles, and support the channel by picking up our own in-game decal. Check it out at the link in the description and we'll see you in-game. The 1950s was an interesting time for armoured vehicle development, with new weapon systems and capabilities seemingly created every year, and new doctrines beginning to evolve around them. The origin of the infantry fighting vehicle concept is a topic for another time, but to grossly oversimplify, the USSR poured their focus into overwhelming heavy tanks after the Second World War, with the likes of the IS-3 and T-10. This would force the Western powers to create the so-called gun tank ideology in order to create a relative parity to these new threats, best represented by the medium M47 Patton II and Heavy Conqueror. The necessary specialisation of such tanks meant that they would inevitably be vulnerable to combinations of infantry mounted anti-tank weapons like the newly produced RPG-2, and light fighting vehicles like the PT-76. This is where the concept of the infantry fighting vehicle is first born, with West Germany's HS-30. The idea was that instead of dedicated personnel carriers, unarmed battle taxis that would retreat to safety after deploying their squadrons, the troop transports themselves should be able to remain in a combat environment, providing direct fire support to the infantry, relieving pressure on the tanks, acting as a force multiplier, and complementing the effective capabilities of everyone on the battlefield. The Soviet Union, immediately recognising the benefits of such a vehicle type, laid out the requirements for what would become the BMP in the year 1959. The vehicle would use a hybrid armament, consisting of the 73mm 2A28 Grom low-pressure gun for use against infantry formations and firing positions at distances of up to 700 meters, alongside the at that time in development Malyutka anti-tank missile. The latter would not only allow the vehicle to engage targets at ranges out to 3 kilometers, but also gave it the ability to directly combat heavy armor itself. This type of weapon set would later become synonymous with the infantry fighting vehicle in general, but for the time was revolutionary. A 7.62mm PKT machine gun was also mounted coaxially with the main cannon, for lighter anti-infantry work and self-defense. A question remained on whether the vehicle should be wheeled or tracked, and three primary design bureaus stepped forward with the prototypes in 1964. Bryansk Automobile Works, or BAZ, presented Object 1200, an eight-wheel design very similar to the new BTR-60 personnel carrier, which ended up being its downfall. The BTR-60 was already considered overweight for its power pack, and the Object 1200 was even more so, 
lacking off-road capability. Its rear-mounted engine also made disembarking troops difficult and time-consuming, a terrible curse in a combat scenario. The most technologically complex designs were presented by the Volgograd Tractor Factory in the Object 911 and 914. These small, tracked vehicles, based on the aforementioned PT-76, featured a set of retractable wheels between their treads, able to be lowered to achieve higher speeds on paved roads, or retracted for better off-road performance. Should this design have offered a tangible benefit to justify its added cost and complexity, it may have become a recognised standard, but for a vehicle designed to be affordable and easy to maintain, the lack of any significant performance increase during mobility trials meant that such designs were rejected. In the end, the winning design was Chelyabinsk Tractor Works Object 764, a fairly typical vehicle when compared to its more outlandish counterparts. Equipped with a front-mounted engine allowing crew to disembark through the two rear doors that accounted for most of the rear hull space, and lacking any bleeding edge complications, the design risked little, but checked all the boxes necessary without chasing expensive innovations. By 1965, when the Altai tractor plant produced its own Object 19, the idea of a hybrid wheeled and track design had already been discarded. After several minor improvements throughout 1965 and 66, the brainchild of Pavel Isakov, now named Object 765, entered service as the BMP-1. The vehicle's 300 horsepower V6 diesel engine and 13 ton combat weight gave it a power to weight ratio of 23 horsepower per ton. While unremarkable by modern standards, this was very impressive for Soviet vehicles of the era. The crew complement comprised three tankers and eight infantrymen, with the vehicle's driver and commander sitting in the front left of the hull, the gunner in the single man turret, and the dismount sitting in a 2x4 configuration in the rear hull. Uniquely to this infantry fighting vehicle, the troops each have their own optic ports, including two in the rear doors, to improve situational awareness upon dismounting in potentially hazardous conditions. They also have portholes for individual firearms, and four hatches atop the rear hull. The three tankers each have their own hatches, and can also exit through the rear doors if necessary, as the entire vehicle is interconnected. All three crew have night vision optics, and the gunner and commander stations can mount infrared spotlights, increasing the commander's visibility range at night to around 400 meters, and the gunner's primary sight to almost a kilometer. Opposite the driver and commander is the BMP's engine, separated by a steel bulkhead to aid in protection. Calling anything on the BMP-1 armor, however, is stretching the imagination, with the vehicle having no more than 20 millimeters on the hull and 30 on the turret barely enough to protect against heavy machine guns or fragmentation from artillery shells. The gun is fed by an autoloader holding 40 rounds of ammunition, with a sustained rate of fire of 10 rounds per minute. The gunner can also load rounds manually, which became necessary for new high explosive ammunition introduced in 1974. In practice, the shaped charge rounds are most typically loaded by hand as well, due to the unreliability of the autoloader which many BMP-1s saw the removal of altogether. Atop the gun sits the 9M14 Malyutka wire-guided anti-tank missile, capable of penetrating 400mm of armour at distances between 500m and 3km. Up to four spare missiles are carried and can be reloaded through a small hatch above the gun, allowing for firing and reloading to be done under armour. The BMP-1 was equipped predominantly to the Soviet's motor rifle brigades, particularly those attached to main battle tank divisions. As standard, the vehicles would carry either Strela surface-to-air missile systems or RPG-7s for use by the dismounts. The vehicle was also amphibious with minimal preparation, propelling itself across rivers and lakes through the use of two rear-mounted water jets. Any type of coastal operation required the support of engineers, but for less demanding crossings, the five minutes to seal hatches and erect the frontal trim vane were the only preparation required. In theory, a BMP unit could be used as a self-contained asset, while also providing the perfect supporting network to a larger division of tanks or infantry. In practice, however, the BMP-1's early combat service brought to light a wide variety of issues. The crew conditions were incredibly cramped, even by Soviet tank standards, costing precious seconds upon dismounting, while the extremely poor armour and survivability of the vehicle, which seemed almost purpose-built to explode catastrophically, caused dismounts to prefer riding exposed on the rear hull rather than inside the vehicle. 
the large fuel tank between the rows of seats, as well as the fuel storage within the two rear doors, was often filled with easily flammable kerosene rather than diesel fuel, meaning the potential for fires or explosions was as much a danger in a combat environment as direct gunfire. The survivability of the main crew instilled even less confidence, with the ammunition being completely unprotected and liable to detonations, and the shape of the front hull virtually guaranteeing the effectiveness of mines, which, rather than detonating at the vehicle's front, would do so under its centre of mass. In the Yom Kippur War, where the BMP saw its first combat at the hands of Egyptian and Syrian forces, the lack of air conditioning in the desert environment, coupled with the small dimensions of the vehicle, made its interior almost unbearably hot. The engine and transmission also showed significant reliability issues, with almost half of the Syrian fleet of BMPs being abandoned due to breakdowns, a scale even worse than the infamously unreliable tanks of the German Wehrmacht. The weapon systems of the BMP proved equally disappointing to not just the Arabic forces, but also the Red Army themselves, who used the vehicle extensively in the Soviet-Afghan war. The Malyutka missile was found to be difficult to guide and time-consuming to load, while the gun, designed to fire out to 700 meters, was barely accurate at half that range. The 73mm high explosive ammunition proved too weak to be used in a demolition role, practically unable to neutralise enemy infantry behind even light cover, while the shaped charge anti-tank warheads capable of penetrating through that cover were known to cause little real damage outside a small hole. Poor gun elevation angles hampered Soviet forces in the mountains of Afghanistan, while the vehicle was so front heavy that without a full complement of infantry in the rear hull, amphibious travel was rendered impossible. Given that the BMP was typically attached to main battle tank divisions, its amphibious capability was of little consequence, especially during the Afghan war, and the so-called Afghan variant BMP-1D instead saw the fitting of applique armour panels, trading any pretense at amphibious capability for the improved protection afforded against mines and heavy machine guns. One of the more extensive upgrades was the BMP-1P, developed after the experience of Yom Kippur and the Angolan Civil War. Built in 1979 and entering widespread service in 81, this variant switched out the manually guided Malyutka missile, known to NATO as AT-3 Sagar, for the much improved 9M13 Conkers, or AT-5 Spandrel. This semi-active or sacklose guided ATGM sits atop a pintle mount on the turret's right hand side, requiring the gunner to stand fully exposed out the open hatch to fire and reload it. This was considered a worthwhile trade-off, however, and many BMP-1s were upgraded to this standard throughout the 1980s, seeing the reloading hatches for the Malyutka missile, which were now redundant, welded shut. The BMP-1P also introduced smoke grenades, a mount for a 30mm grenade launcher, and several other minor upgrades improving reliability and survivability though these continued raising the cost of a vehicle marketed on affordability, undoubtedly tarnishing its reputation. Despite this, the BMP-1 was highly successful on the export market, used not just by the nations of the Warsaw Pact, such as East Germany or Romania, but across Africa, Asia, Europe and the Americas alike, from India and Vietnam, to Sudan and Morocco, to Uruguay and Cuba, to Finland. Both sides of the Iran-Iraq war made use of the type, and both Israel as well as the US-backed Mujahideen in Afghanistan put BMPs they'd captured from the front lines into service in their own armed forces. After receiving a single BMP-1 from Egypt in 1975, China reverse-engineered the WZ-501, intended for the export market. Instead, the People's Liberation Army fielded it themselves as the Type 86, upgrading it with a new engine and ATGM system in the mid-1990s. After reunification in 1990, Germany inherited some 580 BMPs, upgrading them with Western safety equipment, removing the old Soviet missile launchers, and then selling them on again. This is how BMPs made their way into Western allied nations like Sweden and Greece. As the BMP-1's issues began rearing their ugly heads in Yom Kippur, its designers began work on updating its weapon systems, with the main target being the 73mm gun. Meant to take advantage of the best parts of both infantry support vehicles and tanks, the 2A28 Grom in practice embodied only the worst. 
Despite its comparatively low caliber, the cramped turret of the BMP-1 made it so slow to load manually that even main battle tanks with much larger cannons were achieving higher rates of fire, while by this point the autoloader had been all but abandoned. Despite the gun's cumbersome size being an issue however, it was also not large enough, its ammunition putting out unsatisfactory amounts of explosive and shrapnel for its intended role. Thus, the designers had a choice, either go bigger, leaning into the role of an assault gun, or smaller, focusing on rate of fire for covering troops and suppressing enemy positions. In 1974, the Corrigan Mash Savod factory began work on the Object 675, using the standard BMP hull with a new enlarged turret, and replacing the 73mm gun with a 30mm autocannon. This gun, designation 2A42, would prove far superior for infantry support, with more than four times the range and much greater accuracy. Although penetration was lower than a 73mm shaped charge, it was high enough with sable shells to go through light-skinned vehicles at 1500 meters, well beyond what the BMP-1 could hope to reach. Two firing modes could be selected, switching rate of fire between the standard 200 rounds per minute and a rapid fire of 550. A significant upgrade was the two-plane gun stabiliser, and elevation angles were also improved, allowing the gun to be used against low-flying aircraft and attack helicopters. The Pintle-mounted Conkers missile was retained from the BMP-1P, but could be fired and guided remotely without exposing the gunner. In export service, the primary missile would be the less capable 9K111, known to NATO as AT-4 Spigot. Object 675 was quickly selected as a successor to the BMP-1, and entered service in 1980 as the BMP-2. The BMP-2 was just as widely successful as its older brother, seeing service with some 35 countries in this variant alone. Many BMP-1 and Chinese Type 86G variants were upgraded with 30mm autocannons and makeshift turrets to align with the doctrine the BMP-2 had created. India in particular ordered almost 2,000 between 1984 and the end of the 20th century, and 5,000 more since then. One of its only drawbacks was the fact that the BMP-2 could not be simply upgraded to from existing BMP-1s, as there were several major differences to the hull of the vehicle. The tank commander station was moved into the enlarged turret, requiring a whole new turret housing and demanding the removal of two of the four hatches atop the rear hull. This also reduced its capacity from 8 infantrymen to 6, with a 7th taking the commander's old seat in the front, but no room left over for the 8th man. So begins the list of the BMP-2's imperfections. Transporting fewer troops complicated the established organisation, and while operating the ATGM from within the turret was a significant benefit, the fact that reloading still required the gunner to expose himself atop the turret negated this. Loading of the 30mm ammunition into the vehicle proved extremely time-consuming, and although the BMP-2 housed an operated engine compared to its older brother, it was also heavier than the BMP-1 by several tons, offsetting any performance increase and reducing its amphibious capability, or removing it entirely. The BMP-1's vulnerabilities were retained as far as hull survivability, as was the top speed of 65km per hour on-road or 45 off-road matching that of the Red Army's T-72 main battle tanks. While convenient in combined operations, this made the BMP-2 unsuitable for the Armoured Force Reconnaissance role, which had to be left for more lightly armed BTRs. Nonetheless, counting those built in China, over 40,000 BMP-1 and 2 vehicles were produced, and have seen service in every notable conflict from the Angolan Civil War, to the Persian Gulf, the war in Afghanistan, right up to the year 2021, where BMP-2s of Kyrgyzstan were used in a conflict with their Tajik neighbours. The vehicles play an important role, not only bringing troops into an area of operations under armour, but in providing a tank force with a readily available, highly mobile infantry, or an infantry battalion with organic armour and heavy fire support, and tactical mobility. The BMP has in fact been so common that many conflicts such as the Iran-Iraq War, the Chechen Wars, and the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine have seen both sides using large numbers of these vehicles. While Ukraine had begun selling off some of their older model BMPs to countries such as Sri Lanka, they still operate around 1400, while Russia maintain a fleet of multiple thousands. Other current operators of this type consist of Belarus, Kuwait, Syria, and Vietnam. 
while the BMP2 was a highly regarded vehicle by East and West alike, it didn't enjoy its place at the top for long. If BMP1 and 2 are brothers, then the BMP3 is their once removed cousin. Based on the Object 688, known as the Next Generation Infantry Combat Vehicle, the BMP3 entered service in 1987. A completely revised vehicle sharing little commonality with its predecessors, the BMP3 incorporated a new hull design allowing improved protection, with the frontal armour being raised from just 15mm to 80mm. A new 500 horsepower engine, plus a revised transmission and hydropneumatic suspension, meant that despite being heavier again than the BMP2, the BMP3 was faster and more mobile, with the top speed reaching upwards of 70 km per hour. By far the most meaningful changes brought by the new generation of IFVs are their improved weapon systems. The 30mm gun was retained from the BMP2, though a lightened version known as 2A72, with a lower rate of fire. Mounted alongside the 30mm is the main hammer of the BMP3, the 100mm 2A70 rifled cannon. Not only is this weapon capable of lobbing deadly high explosive projectiles, filling the role of an assault gun, but it can also use the 9M117 Bastion ATGM. These laser guided missiles have a range of 6km and can penetrate over 550mm of rolled homogeneous steel armour, with later variants such as the Arcan raising that figure to over 800. The 2A72 autocannon, which uses an advanced ballistics computer and fire control system for engaging helicopters, can range out to 4km accurately with the help of a laser rangefinder. Only a limited number of the large ATGMs can be carried however compared to the more compact 100mm HE shells, and the BMP3's autoloader which can sustain a rate of fire of 15 rounds per minute of conventional 100mm ammunition is so poor at handling the missiles that gunners more often than not elect to load them manually instead. This larger weapon set also complicates the carriage of infantry, as does the engine position low down in the rear hull. In a BMP3, the driver sits further forward in the centre of the front hull, while two infantrymen must sit beside him, the remaining five housed in the more standard rear troop compartment. Disembarking from a BMP3 is also much more problematic than in other IFVs, including its own predecessors, requiring not just the rear doors, but also the top hatches to be opened outwards to give dismounts the space to crawl out over the engine. It may be said that for these reasons, the BMP3 has not been as successful on the international market as its older relatives, being exported to just 13 countries. This is still nonetheless impressive, with Iraq operating as many as 300, Venezuela and Kuwait with 120 each, and even South Korea, a NATO allied country, gratefully receiving 70 BMP3s alongside 35 T-80U main battle tanks as a way for Russia to pay back debts incurred to the country during the Soviet era. Other operators include Morocco, Sri Lanka, Azerbaijan and Cyprus. The largest export customer however is the United Arab Emirates with over 600 models in active service. These saw deployment to Kosovo in 2000, as well as current operations in the Saudi Arabian-led intervention in Yemen. An unknown number of BMP-3s equip the Russian Federation's motorised and mechanised infantry brigades, estimated at around 700 or more. These saw a somewhat mixed success during the First Chechen War in the mid-1990s, with some 20 units being lost, fewer than BMP-1 and 2 variants, but still an unfavourable result. After this conflict, the Kurgan Mashzavod factory began work on an improved BMP-3M, or modernised variant. First on the list was a further improvement to the power pack, with the new engine outputting more than 600 horsepower. The autoloader was likewise improved, allowing it to actually be used with the Arkan missiles, and the gunners and commanders' optics were modernised with latest generation infrared imagers. Armour upgrades consisting of the Cactus armour package with explosive reactive tiles, as well as active protection systems such as the Soft Kill Stora 1 or Hard Kill Arena E, most usually reserved for main battle tanks, have also been spotted by the BMP-3M. As with the majority of such Soviet-designed light vehicles, the BMP was highly adaptable and easily able to accept modular turrets and weapon systems with minimal upgrades. 
Some BMP-1s of Afghanistan or Greece had their turrets replaced with ZU-23 mounts featuring twin 23mm anti-aircraft cannons, while various countries such as Cuba, Romania, Israel, Czechoslovakia, or Russia themselves mounted howitzer and mortar systems to the chassis. The Russian Federation would unveil the 2S-31 Vena, a 120mm mortar carrier based on the BMP-3, in 1997. Finland, Poland, Romania and China mated 25mm cannons in various turret designs, and many nations including Russia used variations of the vehicle as reconnaissance platforms like the BRM-1, artillery fire control posts, command posts, or even ambulance vehicles. The BT-3F is a landing craft iteration of the BMP-3, lacking the cannon-armed turret, but granting an increased capacity of 14 troops. The Iranian Borak personnel carrier was built on the basis of BMP-1s bought from China, some retaining their 73mm guns, while others mount machine guns, autocannons, or ATGMs. India modified their BMP-2s, locally named the Sarath, with two different kinds of 105mm gun turrets, creating more conventional light tanks, as well as a short-range anti-aircraft platform called Trident. This system uses the locally developed flycatcher radar and mounts four surface-to-air missiles with a range of more than 10 kilometers. Despite its promise, however, the vehicle is unlikely to enter serial production. While not possible to simply swap out the BMP-1's turret for that of a BMP-2, BMP-1s did use their 30mm guns, instead electing to borrow turrets from their airborne cousins, the BMD-2 and 3. The Russian Federation took things a step further, showing off the BMP-1AM in 2018, with a remotely operated turret housing the same autocannon. Upgraded weapon systems were applied to both the BMP-2M with the Berezok turret, and BMP-3M with the Boomerang BM or APOC system, bringing newest generation thermographic optics and modern Cornet anti-tank missiles, significantly raising the vehicle's capabilities. The BMP also served as the platform for various light armoured recovery and repair vehicles, like the Brem-2 of the Soviet Union or RMG of the Russian Federation, supplied to engineer units accompanying the motorised brigades. Eventually, the BMP would even make its way into civilian service as the Taiga logging tractor or Berezina emergency relief transport. The BMP-3 chassis, as the more up-to-date of the family, has naturally seen use in more modern applications, branching into the dedicated tank destroyer role, as well as that of short-range air defence or SHORAD. Unveiled in 2005, the 9P-157 Chrysanthema S mounts a twin radar-guided ATGM system and autoloader, while in 2018 the Derevitsia PVO was seen with its 57mm cannon, geared towards defence against drones and incoming missiles. Though both are built on the BMP-3 chassis, we'll go over these two exotic vehicle types in their own in-depth videos. To end our story of one of the Cold War's most influential vehicles, it's important to understand just how instrumental it's truly been. The infantry fighting vehicle concept has proven its worth in battle time and time again, but the BMP series brings some characteristics uniquely suited to the Soviet and now Russian military doctrine. A factor that almost always gets overlooked in the world of military tech review is organisation or force structure, and the way in which the IFV aids this should not be overstated. It's no coincidence that virtually every infantry fighting vehicle type houses exactly the number of troops that make up one squadron in their respective nation's army, and in fact the BMP, like the later American Bradley, saw initial prototypes redesigned as they were built with room for too many troops. On the other side of that coin, the Polish BWP-40, an attempt to mate BMP-1 hulls with Swedish CV-90 turrets and 40mm guns, failed to make it past the prototype stage as redesigning the hull for the larger turret reduced the crew capacity to just four soldiers. Squadrons of infantry and platoons of tanks often work closely together, but still act as separate assets on a battlefield. Therefore, if a tank platoon leader wants to call for an infantry squad to aid them in an urban environment, the request must be passed up the chain of command and relayed back through the infantry, who then organise with the tankers that called it in. And the same goes for infantry battalions faced with threats where armoured support is needed. Having organic assets of troops available to a tank battalion, or armour and heavy firepower to infantry divisions, without having to take from and organise with another unit, 
is the main draw of the IFV. When it comes to how Russia have armed their IFVs, specifically having settled on the BMP-3, it clearly lines up with how Russia organise their force structure and operate in a combat environment. Having a 100mm assault gun plus a 30mm autocannon, rather than the German Marder with a faster firing 20mm, or the American Bradley's 25mm Bushmaster, makes perfect sense given how these units interact with tank platoons and infantry squadrons and other vehicles in the company. It's easy to see how this ideology was attempted with the BMP-1, despite the failings of its 73mm cannon. The BMP-2 no doubt improved on the design, but the BMP-3 mastered its intended role, and while the American Stryker family sees different variations filling each individual role of infantry carrier, mortar carrier, direct fire support, missile launcher, or even assault gun. The BMP-3 effectively puts them all into the one package, while still managing to be half the size. It is thought, however, that with the complications added into the carrying and disembarking of troops, the designers of the BMP-3 may have forgotten that the primary focus of an infantry fighting vehicle is the infantry. In the end, this is an impressive vehicle that served its users well and easily cornered its market for decades, and while its intended replacements, like the Kurganets 25 or T-15 Armata, do make them look outmoded by comparison, the BMP series are not likely to be going anywhere anytime soon. Well lads, I hope you've really enjoyed this video. We used a bit of a different commentary style here, so let me know what you thought. Been a long time coming this one, I've had a number of personal difficulties and distractions that have kept me from working on it, and things I won't go into here. Of course with the situation unfolding in Eastern Europe and Ukraine, we want to be very sensitive when we talk about this type of technology, but uh, I want to thank you lads for bearing with me, and I really hope you'll welcome us back as we return to regular uploads. We will be coming back with another episode of Your Favourite Tank Sucks very soon. Episode 2 is at over 2.5 million views now, which is insane, uh, so get pumped for that. If you did enjoy this video, remember to subscribe and check out the rest of the content we put out. Support us on Patreon if you do want to help us make these videos. It really goes a very long way, especially funding, sort of bringing in some help and improving production value. But uh, until next time, thank you all for watching, stay safe, and I'll catch you on the battlefield. Thank you to all our supporters on Patreon for making this video possible, with a special thanks to Mo, Ian Anderson, Universe, Dean Winger, Sukoshi Tiger, Captain Fubar, Dragon of the West, and Dagger68. If you like this video, I hope you subscribe and check out our other content, and if you really like what we do here, then consider supporting the channel on Patreon. And thanks for watching. When it comes to flight performance, nothing in game really touches the F-14A overall. There are a few planes that accelerate faster, climb faster, a couple that hit higher speeds at high altitude, it is the fastest on the deck by quite a bit, and while a couple have a tighter turning radius or a higher turn rate, the F-14 does everything better than any other jet can.